Um, so this morning we'll be talking about uh, the surgical management of renal calculi. And uh, I thought I'd like to start with uh, just a small case. Uh, we have a 68-year-old gentleman presenting with a uh, 2-centimeter left renal pelvic stone. He's got multiple comorbidities, so he's got diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease. What would be the uh, best treatment option for this gentleman? Would be observation, shockwave, ureteroscopy, or PML? Uh, so similarly, a different case, patient presents with bilateral staghorn stones. What is the optimal management strategy for this gentleman? So before we can really talk about the uh, treatment of kidney stones, I think we need to understand what the natural history of kidney stones is. So we really have to ask ourselves, do kidney stones need to be treated? And if so, which ones? Um, we know that you know, the observation of kidney stones really depends on their natural history. Unfortunately, though, for really small asymptomatic non-obstructing calocele stones, that natural history is quite poorly defined and the risk of progression is unclear. So let's say, for example, you have a 31-year-old female coming into your office. She's complaining of some epigastric abdominal pain. Family doctor orders an abdominal ultrasound, finds a lower pole, four millimeter stone, follows that up with a KUB. She's otherwise asymptomatic with no pain, no hematuria, no urine infections, has normal renal function, and she wishes to start a family, but she asks you, you know, should this stone be treated before I become pregnant? What uh, should we tell her? <clears throat> so um, this group out in Turkey, um, they did a prospective study looking at these uh, lower pole calocele stones that were asymptomatic. And uh, they had a total of 27 kidneys, 27 kidney stones in 24 patients. And uh, basically followed these patients every six months and performed regular imaging on them. Uh, they assess these patients in terms of progression, um, and so they define progression as pain, stone growth, recurrent urine infections, or gross hematuria. What they found was that about 9 out of 27 of them uh, had increase in stone size, and out of those, 3 of them required intervention. So one of them required shockwave, one PNL, and one uroscopy. Almost 19% became stone-free after uh, an average of uh, 52 months of assessment. And so they concluded that smaller calculi are very likely to pass. Uh, we know that asymptomatic lower pole stones can be safely observed as long as you tell the patient that there is a risk, and, uh, a risk of progression and about a 33% progression rate for these sm uh, small lower pole stones. Um, so this is a different uh, trial. It's actually a randomized controlled trial looking at shockwave versus um, observation for asymptomatic uh, small calocele stones, and basically they had 220 patients with stones that were less than 1.5 centimeters. Half of them were randomized to shockwave and half of them were randomized to observation only, and they assessed outcomes in terms of stone-free rate, symptoms, quality of life, and renal function. What they found was that the stone-free rate was about 28% for the group that underwent shockwave compared to 17% in those that were observed but there was no statistical significant difference. And um, about 15% of those in the shockwave group versus 21% in the observation group underwent further treatment. So this was either antibiotics, more analgesics, or another procedure. None of the patients in the shockwave group required invasive treatments, which they defined as stenting or ureteroscopy compared to 8%. There was no difference in terms of overall quality of life, renal function, and so they concluded that prophylactic shockwave lithotripsy for very small asymptomatic stones probably has no real benefit in terms of stone-free rate, quality of life, renal function, symptoms, hospital admission, but observation alone may lead to requirement of more invasive procedures. So based on the EAU guidelines this year, um, you know, it's still debatable whether small kidney stones need to be treated, and uh, if you do uh, just <coughs> observed stones, they should be um, uh, observed and uh, annual follow-up is uh, basically sufficient. Kidney stones are undergoing growth, uh, have uh, de novo obstruction, uh, cause infection or become symptomatic should definitely be stone, uh, uh, treated. And in terms of comorbidities and patient preference, these should be taken into consideration when you decide what type of treatment modalities to undertake for these patients. If you don't treat the stones, obviously they require periodic evaluation. And here at VGH, we do um, KUB and ultrasound every six, six to 12 months for these patients. 
So let's say you have an 80-year-old gentleman, multiple comorbidities. If he's got a two centimeter lower pole stone that's not bothering him, he can probably be observed. If it's in the renal pelvis, given the higher likelihood of obstruction, he'll probably require active treatment. So now we know that the different options for stone removal include shockwave lithotripsy, PCNL, ureoscopy, and even open laparoscopic or robotic pyelolithotomy. In the shockwave group, I want to look at, first of all, management of shockwave failure. So this is a plain film looking at a gentleman uh, with a proximal 8 millimeter ureteric stone, uh, and that's the CT on the left. Um, so pre-litho plain film, post-litho uh, plain film, there's no real significant change to that ureteric stone. What should we do now? So should we undergo, should he undergo more shockwave lithotripsy, ureteroscopy, or should we observe him? So uh, Dr. Pace and Dr. Honey's group out in Toronto looked at 1,600 ureteral stones, which they treated with a lithotripter, and they followed them at two weeks and three months with a plain film. They compared the stone-free rates of the initial treatment versus retreatment. They also looked at um, a multivariate analysis at looking at different factors that might predict for stone-free status. So stone size, location, BMI of the patient, and whether or not a ureteric stent was used. What they found was that the stone-free rate overall out of the 1,600 stones was about 68%. But failing for those stones that did not undergo full treatment, um, if you underwent a second uh, shockwave treatment, there are only 8% more incremental benefit. And then that decreased to 1% and 1% again for three or more uh, subsequent repeat treatments. So in conclusion, they felt that retreatment success rates for shockwave are quite low for both renal and ureteric uh, calculi. Uh, patients that fail or have a poor response to the initial shockwave should probably be considered for ureteroscopy. What was interesting was that they found that stenting of these ureteric stones pre as well actually decreased the stone free rate. So, compared to the stented group with a similar stone size, patients with no stent and stones that were less than 10 millimeters had an 8% better stone free rate. Patients that had no stent and a stone size of 11 to 20 millimeters had uh, almost a 21% better stone free rate. So that brings us to the next subject I want to talk about for shockwave. You know, what is the role of stenting pre s -well, And what are the, some of the potential downfalls of stenting? So this was a um, randomized trial looking at shockwave lithotripsy in large renal calculi, like greater than two centimeters. And they randomized patients to shockwave without a stent and shockwave with a stent. What they found was that the overall uh, post-shockwave lithotripsy complications, there was no statistic difference between the two groups. So you can see 17% of patients had fever, 20% in the stented group. Uh, Stein stress incidence was about the same. But what there was was increased morbidity from the stents in terms of calcification, migration. And the stone-free rate wasn't very convincingly better for the stented group. So 44% versus 35%. So these authors did not recommend it. Um, this was a systematic review of eight clinical randomized trials. So they combined uh, eight of these trials together and looked at overall um, uh, stone-free rates in terms of patients that were stented before and after, uh, patients that had stents and without stents for shockwave lithotripsy. What they found was that the stone-free rate amongst all eight trials was about the same between stented and non-stented groups, 78% and 83%. The incidence of Steinstrasse was very similar, and there was no real difference other than one trial. One trial reported that there might be a possible advantage with stenting for prevention of Steinstrasse. There was a significantly increase in a number of patients with lower urinary tract symptoms for those that were stented, and no difference in terms of auxiliary treatments. So they concluded that pre-stenting for a shockwave lithotripsy remains controversial. And again, there's no real difference in the stone-free rates, auxiliary treatment requirements, and maybe an advantage for Stein stressing. Um, so this was a very interesting matched pair analysis uh, for ureteric stents. So basically, they looked at patients that had ureteric stones. Uh, they found 45 patients that were presented before s -well, and they were presented for reasons of infection, obstruction, or pain. And they matched these patients to those that did not have stents. Uh, they matched them by gender side of uh, a stone and location within the ureter and the size of stone. And what they found was that actually the stented group had a, had a, a much lower stone-free rate at a three-month follow-up. So 71% in the stented group versus 93% in the unstented group. 
So stenting actually may lower your stone free rate for shockwave and ureteric stones. There is still a role of, though in obstruction, sepsis, and renal failure. But if you imagine the size of a ureter, if you're occluding that surface area, that cross-sectional surface area with a stent, then you might have decreased stone free passage uh, rates. So there are still some indications for stent use. Obviously, absolute indications, obstructive pylo, renal failure, and solitary kidney. But these relative indications, such as stone size, pain management, you know, it might be more controversial based on the previous studies. So next, we want to, to look at Steinstrasse. And, uh, you know, there's a different classification system for Steinstrasse. Um, and so this is a patient with a type 3 Steinstrasse. You can see all those large fragments that are obstructing its distal ureter. Uh, this was a, a study done in Egypt looking at 880 patients that were treated for stones. They found a 6% incidence of Steinstrasse. Five of those patients were actually pre-stented, still developed Steinstrasse. Um, after their initial shockwave lithotripsy treatment, they were followed with routine imaging. And so they treated these patients with Steinstrasse uh, based on their algorithm. So if they were asymptomatic with mild hydronephrosis, these patients were observed. Um, so they had you know, pain control, antibiotics, and just routine follow-up. If there was moderate obstruction or type 2 or 3 Steinstrasse, they tried to perform shockwave for the leading fragment. If there was severe obstruction, then they put in a perk nephrostomy tube. And their reasoning was that when you lower that intrapelvic pressure, that will help to reestablish ureteric peristalsis. And again, if that didn't work, failure of resolution of all of those things, then they performed ureoscopy if needed, and in one instance, they had to do open ureal lithotomy. So they found that obviously the incidence of Steinstrass increased with larger stone sizes. So for stones that were greater than two centimeters, there was an 11% incidence. And about half of patients could, could be treated conservatively just from watching them and having good pain control. Another one quarter of them required repeat shockwave of the leading fragment, and about 20% of them required a perk nephrostomy tube. Uh, what they found, though, was, again, large stone burden, and anything that causes impaired urinary drainage, such as strictures, those things predispose to sinus stress. Um, ureteroscopy in this setting, they felt was very difficult because they had difficulty passing the guide wires, and they, you know, it's more easy to perforate the ureter in this setting. Uh, they felt that ureteric stenting before shockwave did not prevent Steinstrass, but again, you get the benefit of urinary drainage. So in this setting, potentially we could consider PNL as first-line therapy. This was a study looking at pediatric population. Uh, so basically 400 kidney stones in 380 pa uh, patients, children. And they s divided them into three different groups based on stone size, so less than one centimeter, one to two centimeters, and greater than two centimeters. And basically, um, they, uh, the incidence of Steinstrass increased as the stone size got bigger. Uh, a lot of them were managed conservatively, so about 15%, but an overwhelming majority of them underwent repeat shockwave and that resolved their Steinstrass aid. Um, some of them had failure of shockwave and required ureoscopy again, and one patient had ureoscopy as primary treatment, but they found that basically, again, stone burden statistically correlates with formation of Steinstrass. Repeat shockwave is safe and effective in most pediatric patients. There wasn't any significant complications that resulted from these patients. One thing we should consider is that children probably have a much wider ureter and it's a bit more stretchy. And that's what facilitates that shockwave of the leading fragment and makes it so effective. So in conclusion, again, stone burden correlates with the risk of Steinstrass aid. There's other factors such as causing impaired urinary drainage, which will increase that risk as well. Pre-stenting didn't seem to prevent Steinstrass, but again, allows for urinary drainage. Shockwave thing, the leading fragment is a treatment option, and ureoscopy can be difficult. So uh, we may want to consider PNL for larger stones such as these. So moving on to PCNL, so uh, I want to look at what is the ideal drainage post-operatively for these patients. And then something new is uh, there's a potential possibility of an outpatient tubeless PNL. Um, so PNL is used in a variety of situations to treat different kidney stones, especially larger stones, uh, as first-line therapy. Um, so based on the guidelines here, uh, in terms of tube management after PNL, there's uh, several factors that need to need to be considered when we're deciding about post-operative drainage. So 
does this patient have residual stones? Um, uh, how likely is, are they to require a second look procedure? Was there a lot of bleeding during the case? Uh, wow. Any uh, perforation, urinary extravasation, and if they have a solitary kidney? So um, this looked at tubeless p and um, they presented it as possibly a new gold standard. So 120 patients undergoing p &L. They excluded any patients that had prolonged OR time, um, any injury to the collecting system, or any significant bleeding or residual stones. These patients, they just left a six French an external retrograde stent, so basically a polycatheter, and they all followed them up with imaging on, on the first day postoperatively. Um, what they found was, in terms of stone-free rate, pretty good, 86%. If those patients that did have residual stones underwent shockwave treatments, and for those, if you consider those, their success rate was actually almost 97% for these patients. Um, so interestingly, they did leave those stents in for about um, 7 to 72 hours after their PNL procedure. In terms of complications that resulted from doing this, they only, only one patient required the placement of a double J internal ureteric stent, and that was for urinary extravasation. Uh, five of their patients did require blood transfusion, so 4%. And what you can see is their incidence of patients requiring any analgesic at all postoperatively was very low, so 18% of them. Um, so in conclusion, they felt that tubeless p &L is a very good option for lowering postoperative pain, uh, <coughs> lowers your analgesic use, and it can reduce your hospital stay in uncomplicated cases. So even though tubeless approach is um, stated in the literature quite a bit, um, uh, the, one of the PCNL global studies showed that this tubeless approach is actually only adopted in very few patients, 1.7% out of the 5,800 patients in their database. So what happens if you do have a complicated pain <coughs> though? Uh, what kind of nephrostomy drainage is optimal and does the nephrostomy size matter? So this group uh, looked at the CROWS database. So um, they basically looked at all patients that underwent p &L and had nephrostomy tubes inserted of a known size had almost 4,000 patients. They divided them into two groups. So those that had large bore nephrostomy tubes, so greater than 18 French, and small bore nephrostomy tubes. They looked at the impact of this nephrostomy tube and sheath size during the operation on post-operative hemoglobin reduction. So how many people bled more? They looked at the stone-free rates based on imaging as well. So interestingly, it's pretty much 50-50. Uh, 2,000 of them had small bore, 2,000 had large bore. Majority were, were very healthy patients, ASA 1 or 2. And interestingly, so the large board group were more older and had more stone burden. The patients in the small board group, though, were more likely to have been anticoagulated. So 112 of those versus 79. So keep that in mind. So in terms of the reduction in hemoglobin, they found that patients that had the smaller nephrostomy tubes tended to bleed more. But again, they were more likely anticoagulated. And then in terms of the total complication rates, it also seemed that 20% of those with the small nephrostomy tubes had complications versus 15%. So maybe a lower complication rate with large nephrostomy tubes. Stone-free rate was about the same for both, 78%. So in conclusion, they felt that patients that had large bore nephrostomy tubes were less likely to have post-operative blood loss. Um, they did not compare the amount of pain that they had after the operation. And so there's some of the data limitations though, uh, there are some data quality concerns with the CROWS database. It's such a large uh, database and it's multi-institutional, uh, transnational. Um, and they felt, uh, and, and what we know is that the small board group was actually more likely to have been anticoagulated. So it's hard to assess what the impact of that was on bleeding. So what do we do at VGH? So uh, basically we perform for most uncomplicated cases, tubeless p &L. We usually leave a five French uh, safety DAF catheter in. And um, interestingly, a group in Spain actually reported this. And the advantage of doing this is that the patient is essentially tubeless, so post-operative analgesic use is probably lower. But the uh, leaving a DAF catheter in place gives us the opportunity for a second look through the same PERC site if needed based on their imaging, if they have significant stones, or if we need to get uh, a stent inserted like an internal external for bleeding or whatnot. Um, and again, this group found that the, this modification of tubeless p &L was safe, simple, with no significant complications. So now what I want to look at was most of our patients after p &L, 
they um, stay in hospital for a, a night, and if there's no issues, then they all go home the next day. Um, a group out in uh, at Queen's University actually looked at outpatient tubeless PNL, so they would do PNL on these patients. I see some cringing in the audience, but um, they would do outpatient PNL. So these uh, they had a very small case series of three patients uh, with very quite small stones, actually 1.4 centimeters, and they operate on them for about 90 minutes. The mean time after leaving the recovery room from being discharged home is only two and a half hours compared to the usual 24 hours for us. Um, they did leave an internal ureteric stent, uh, like a JJ stent, in place after the operation. Now, it's not easy to, to select patients for this, but they had very strict criteria. So basically, the patients that they selected for this outpatient PNL. Um, they had to have normal renal function, no significant medical comorbidity, so they had to be quite healthy. And intraoperatively, they, they hadn't, there had to be no significant bleeding, uh, no uh, significant uh, perforation of the collecting system, and, um, and whatnot. In terms of post-operative considerations, they, these patients were patients that had minimal pain, um, no significant leakage around the flange site, and no significant hematuria and obviously stable vitals. Um, so they did present this and they felt that, you know, this is a potential way that we can reduce costs in hospital um, and avoid inpatient stay. Obviously the limitations are that it, this is a very small case series, only three patients, and the stones that they treated were smaller, smaller than the ones typically we do here maybe. And um, they did not put upper pole uh, punctures as, as an official exclusion criteria, but they did feel that it could be. Um, and in conclusion, basically they felt that this is a possibility in properly selected patients. And obviously we have to look at a much larger population to really know um, what the potential complications and issues are from sending patients home on the post-operative day zero. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think that's why this has not gained widespread popularity, and it's uh, they're the first group to have reported it. Um, I think if we do have more studies, though, looking at this. It may be a potential possibility that we can weed out those patients because a lot of patients, sometimes you see them, you know, they, they don't really have a really complicated course of stay in hospital and they may have gone home the previous day. Um, so other options for active stone removal, so ureoscopy, some of the new updates in the guidelines, they do recommend short-term antibiotic prophylaxis. They recommend placing a safety wire and they do not recommend blind basketing. I don't know how often that's done anymore. And uh, the nice thing about uroscopy is that you can do it in patients that are even fully anticoagulated. Uh, other treatment options, open laparoscopic pyelolithotomy, very limited role in developed countries. Uh, there's this nice study looking at PCNL versus open uh, pyelolithotomy for staghorn stones. And about, uh, they basically found that PCNL was much better in terms of shorter operative times, shorter hospital stays, earlier return to work, and very similar stone-free rates. Uh, robotic pyelolithotomy has also been reported in the literature. Usually what they did find was for patients that have, for example, congenital UPJ obstruction or a concomitant uh, UPJ obstruction with stones, then that is an option that they use. So, uh, short-term antibiotics, uh, that's, they, they didn't define that, but it is. Um, so now I want to basically look at quickly the treatment modalities that we should select based on the stone size and location. Uh, so lower pole stones, what is the optimal treatment? Shockwave, uroscopy, PNL. Um, this study basically looked at the efficacy of shockwave lithotripsy and PNL for treatment of symptomatic lower pole stones. And these stones were actually less than three centimeters, so quite a varied size of these stones. They had about half patients undergo PNL and half of them undergo shockwave lithotripsy. 
they followed these patients at three months of uh, three months time, and uh, basically they found that obviously the stone free rate was much higher in those that underwent PNL, ninety five percent versus thirty seven percent in those that underwent shockwave, and they found that shockwave was especially bad for stones that were greater than a centimeter, only a twenty one percent stone free rate. Um, they actually found that there was a comparable complication rate uh, and stone composition type, uh, but you know a lot of the literature suggests that PNL has much sig more significant types of complications. So you know we know that in conclusion they were if these are looking at this table is looking at basically the stone free rates based on stone size, and you can see that even for very small stones less than a centimeter, there is about uh, you know a 37 uh, percent incremental benefit or a higher stone free rate from undergoing PNL versus shockwave. And that drops dramatically as the stones get larger. Uh, so this one is another stone uh, study looking at shockwave versus ureteroscopy now. And this is for smaller lower pole stones, so less than one centimeter. Uh, so they had about 67 patients that had lower pole stones that fit this criteria. And they basically assessed the stone free rates at three months. Secondary criteria that they looked at were length of stay, complications, uh, the need for other ancillary auxiliary procedures, and the patient-derived quality of life. What is interesting is um, they had about 50-50. The stone-free rates in those that underwent shock wave was about 35% compared to 50% for ureoscopy. So the ureoscopy patients actually had higher stone-free rates, but the patient-derived quality of life, based on their questionnaires, patients favored shock wave. So, you know, the stone-free rates wasn't really statistically different, but patients preferred shockwave more. And so 90% of those patients that were surveyed actually would have the same procedure done over again versus 63% for those that had ureteroscopy. So these are some considerations that we need to take into account when we're deciding the treatment options. So now what about one to two centimeter stones? So based on the EAU guidelines, we know that PNL, ureteroscopy, or shockwave are all reasonable options for these. So which, is there any that's quite, uh, that is better? So this was a really interesting study looking at ureteroscopy versus percutaneous treatments for these medium-sized stones. And they want to compare PNL and ureteroscopy and look at stone clearance rates and morbidity. So they had a smaller uh, cohort of patients, about 27 patients, it's a retrospective review. Um, basically, there was just very similar operative time and complication rates amongst the two groups. The stone-free rates seem to be better for PNL, 87% versus 65% for ureteroscopy. They didn't find that it was statistically significant or different. But in conclusion, they felt that both options were effective for one to two centimeter stones. And really, ultimately what it boils down to is surgeon preference and level of expertise, so what you're more comfortable doing in this setting. Um, so this is PNL versus shockwave lithotripsy for the same size stones. Okay, so comparing that, and basically, um, they excluded patients that were pregnant, had bleeding diathesis, uh, anticoagulator, or whatnot, and uh, they basically determined stone-free status at three months. PNL patients again were much more likely to have been stone-free. Uh, so, 95% versus 16% in those at one week, and 85% versus 33% at three-month follow-up. And you can see that the stone-free rate actually decreased over time. That's because they used plain film at one week and a CT scan at three months, so maybe there were some residual stones that weren't seen on the plain films. What about the treatment of very large stones? So we know that this is a, a table from the EAU guidelines this year, and basically for stones that are greater than two centimeters, PNL is the first treatment modality that they recommend, followed by ureteroscopy or shockwave. Um, it is PNL is regarded the gold standard for treatment of large stones, but how does ureteroscopy and shockwave compare? Um, so this was a uh, retrospective review looking at 15 patients with large renal capillaries, so two to two and a half centimeters. All of them underwent actually primary ureteroscopy with a secondary second look ureteroscopy procedure after that, and uh, actually 66% of those patients, two thirds, only required that one. Uh, primary ureteroscopy procedure. Um, about a quarter of patients did require two treatments and one patient required a third treatment. But their overall stone free weight was actually 93%. So, um, you know, overall, PNL has a better stone free rate if you look at per procedure basis, 
So one, if you have one operation to get the stone free, get them stone free, PNL is better. But uh, you know, if you're allowed for patients to have multiple repeated procedures, then your SB actually gives you quite good stone free rates and they might have less morbidity and decrease hospital stay. So most patients with uroscopy will go home day one. And this uh, was a very similar finding found across multiple trials, as you can see here. So um, each of those three trials had stone free rates over 90%. And the mean number of procedures required was not that high, so one to two, one and a half to two procedures. So absolute indications for uroscopy, again, for these large stones, if patients are, have irreversible coagulopathy, uh, you can do ureoscopy safely and those even fully anticoagulated on warfarin or whatnot. They did not find a significant difference in stone-free rates and intra or post-operative complications. Uh, we know that bleeding risk is increased if you use EHL, so electrohydraulic lithotripsy. And so, you know, an, a relative indication for uroscopy might be if they're morbidly obese and, you know, those sometimes when you're doing PNLs on these patients, the tracks aren't quite long enough, your instruments aren't long enough to reach a screen. Um, so this basically compared all three modalities. So, you know, um, Dr. Pace's group in Toronto looked at uh, shockwave, ureoscopy, and PNL and looked at stones that are one to three centimeters. What you can see here, though, is that uh, the patients that underwent PNL had a larger average stone size. They had a much higher success rate, so 95% stone clearance rate. But they suggested that with shockwave lithotripsy, uh, after the first shockwave treatment, about 60% uh, stone free rate and success rate. With a second shockwave, they got that up to 80%. So, um, you know, they, they did feel that shockwave was reasonable in patients that prefer shockwave and especially patients that are poor surgical candidates. So in conclusion, for treatment conclusions, uh, we know that for lower pole stones, um, shockwave can be a first-line treatment if it's less than two centimeters, but we know that the stone-free rate um, is worse as the stone size increases. For one to two centimeters uh, stones, shockwave lithotripsy, uh, if you choose that modality, you should probably use a slower rate uh, you should probably use some medical expulsive therapy afterwards. And other factors that to take into consideration would be skin to stone distance and the number of Hounsfield units, so looking at stone density for shockwave uh, efficiency. And then the placement of a stent is controversial. And then again, the treatment of residual stones, uh, that is controversial whether or not you want to put them through further shockwave or you should move on to uroscopy. Uroscopy itself is a viable alternative for one to two centimeter stones. Um, so we should probably try to use dusting as opposed to breaking them up into larger fragments because that will help increase the stone free rate and then stenting afterwards. Uh, so for PNL, so it does give you the best stone free rate, but it does have the highest potential complications. So you might want to reserve that from your larger stones, so greater than two centimeter stones, where PNL has been proven to much have a much uh, superior stone free rate. Uh, ureoscopy, though, is a viable alternative with lower morbidity, so consider that in, in your more sicker patients. Um, so again, going over the guidelines again, so for lower pole stones that are one to two centimeters, if they have favorable factors for shockwave, you should probably do shockwave or PNL ureoscopy. If they don't have favorable factors, you should probably use shockwave as second line therapy. Unfavorable factors again, shockwave resistant stones, if they have a steep infundibular pelvic angle on imaging, uh, longer lower pole calyces, and uh, narrow infundibulum. Uh, so this is their other table looking at the general management, and we've already talked about all of these. So greater than two centimeter stones, PNL first line, followed by uroscopy and shockwave. One to two centimeter stones, shockwave or PNL uroscopy are all uh, options. And for less than one centimeter stone, shockwave, uroscopy, and then PNL as second line treatment. What I want to talk about now was very interesting. Um, so at VGH now, we have this ultra low dose CT protocol that we can uh, use for patients that have renal colic. And this was a, a article that they have on the VCH website, so you can find this article there. And they have this new stellar detector. Basically, this new CT scanner uses technology which is able to transmit analog signals uh, with minimal wiring. And so you can digitize uh, the measured signals that you have with very little interference, so no, no significant noise in the, in the signal. 
And basically they felt, feel that this ultra low dose CT may make x-rays obsolete. And by doing that, uh, you know, uh, you can have improved patient care because the ultra low dose CTs can see things that plain film cannot. And so you can uh, base your treatment uh, decisions and management decisions based on better information, better diagnostic information. Uh, so this was a table that um, uh, Dr. McLaughlin, one of the radiologists gave me, was looking at the plain film radiation doses. It's actually quite variable. So chest x-rays, we know have very low radiation dose, so 0.1 to 0.2 millisieverts, and that's because there's all this air in your lungs, right? But abdominal x-rays have about 0.7 millisieverts, which is still quite low. Uh, but it's quite variable in terms of the amount of radiation that you get per abdominal plane film. And factors that affect dose would be BMI and whether the patient has metal harbor or not. So, you know, x-rays are not necessarily as low radiation as we think. Uh, the previously mentioned some of the technical advances in CT imaging, so automated exposure control uh, and the use of these reconstruction algorithms, um, iterative, what they call iterative image reconstruction algorithms, uh, help reduce noise in your image. Um, other things include the new integrated circuit boards, uh, circuit boards, sorry. Uh, there's less electronic noise and uh, better what they call quantum efficiency. So ultra low dose CT actually has less radiation than a plain x-ray. And so for the evaluation of renal stones, this can actually detect stones that are unseen on plain film x-ray. So this study was done here at VGH, um, Dr. McLaughlin's group. and um, they looked at the impact or the performance of these low dose non-contrast CTs in the urinary tract. So if you look there, uh, the low dose CTs have about 0.5 millisieverts of uh, radiation compared to a normal CT scan, which is almost 10 times that, so 4.4 millisieverts. Plain films of the abdomen, 0.7 millisieverts, so definitely lower for the low dose CT group. They had 33 patients with renal colic, and basically what they found was the kidney stones were found in 27 of those patients if you use the 70% type of uh, iterative reconstruction algorithm, uh, if you put them through that filter. Uh, the sensitivity specificity was 87 and 100% for stones that were greater than 3 millimeters, and so it is a very good option. So these are some of the images that you get with ultra low dose CT versus conventional CT. So, you know, 5.1 millisieverts gives you that type of image quality. But at one-tenth the radiation dose, the image quality is actually not a lot worse. And you can still see that if you're looking at kidney stones, you can see that proximal ureteric stone there and that very small lower pole fleck can still be seen on both images. So this was actually a case that we had here at EGH, a 17-year-old girl with a history of right renal calculi. She was treated with right-sided shockwave lithotripsy. And, you know, at three months post-op follow-up, she was still symptomatic, but now she was having some pain on her left side intermittently. So we thought she might have left-sided stones, so we brought her in for uh, planned as well. But before her shockwave, we did another plain film. We didn't see any stones uh, in her left kidney. So instead of sending her home because we couldn't see anything, she actually went through the low-dose, ultra-low-dose CT protocol. And... Um, it revealed that she did have a three millimeter left renal calculus there. And so she underwent left shockwave for that stone. Um, so ultra low dose CT now at VGH still, what's that? It's really strange. She was symptomatic from a three millimeter stone. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a great question. I, I don't know. About that. Uh, I presume, but I don't know. It was such a small stone, it's hard to tell. But uh, I'm guessing that because the stone was so small, she may have. Um, so currently, ultra-low dose uh, here at VGH, it's investigational still, but it can be ordered for your outpatients. Um, the thing is, you're, we're not really able to order it for emergency uh, patients that emerge because um, after talking to Dr. McLaughlin, not all the radiologists can read ultra-low dose CT. There's still a lack of awareness amongst the emergency physician staff here. And again, the lower radiation doses does equal poorer image quality. And so you may potentially miss other diagnoses. But again, this ultra low dose CT scan does have the advantage of much lower radiation compared to even a plain film and definitely compared to a conventional CT. 
and it may show small stones better than plain film uh, x-rays. So with that, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank Dr. Ben Chu for his help with my presentation, as well as Dr. McLaughlin. Any questions or concerns? <laughs>